Well, good morning, church family. Is it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Indeed it is. Ah, there is so much going on this morning. Uh, I love every minute of it. I love being a part of this church. Thank you for those that have shared in worship, and thank you for uh, sharing your talents with us, and uh, thank you for the blessings of God, even the crumbs that fall. We are unworthy of, but what a blessing those crumbs are, and we're blessed with even more. We feast upon so many blessings and so much that God gives us, and we, we take that for granted sometimes, and I, I, just, I just thank God for all of those things. Well, like each Sunday, we have gathered together to worship God, to glorify and to honor Christ, and with the help of the Holy Spirit to grow in our understanding, to learn more about the life of Christ, to learn more about the death of Christ, to learn more about the good news of Christ, because Jesus is our focus. Christ is our center. However, I must acknowledge that today is a special day, a day where we celebrate mothers. So, Mom, Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Amanda, and Happy Mother's Day to all the wonderful mothers that we have gathered this morning and to those who are watching online. You know, I I tried in preparation, I tried to search for a nice Mother's Day poem, you know, something that I could read, and uh, gosh, I just couldn't find anything that was was just right for the occasion, and um, I did find... Uh, a quote from a, a sermon given by Pastor Randy Smith, and he's a, a senior pastor at, at Grace Bible Church in Allenwood, New Jersey. And he said, All those attributes of God that bring us so much comfort are revealed in the heart of a Christian mother. Even the Bible takes the heart of a mother and then uses it as an example for other biblical relationships. For example, when God wanted to illustrate His tenderness for His people, He said in Isaiah 66, As one whom His mother comforts, so I will comfort you. And you will be comforted in Jerusalem. That's Isaiah 66, 13. And when Paul spoke of his pastor's heart for the church, he said, But we prove to be gentle among you. As a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. And some might remember that pretty recently. That's in 1 Thessalonians 2 7. And when David considered his hope in the Lord, he said, Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. Psalm 131, verse 2. So I just want to say thank you. Mothers, for your loving hearts, for your tender care, and for your soothing smile. And may your children return some of that love to you each day. Okay, so now on to today's sermon. Uh, We will be covering the end of Philippians chapter 1. We're going to cover verses 27 through 30, 27 to the end of chapter 1. And this morning, we will be covering citizenship. Paul uses language regarding citizenship. And the Philippians were familiar with this language, and they understood what Paul was talking about. And the Philippians either took pride in their Roman citizenship or, at the very least, understood what it meant to be a Roman citizen. So, if you would please uh, stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, and we'll be reading reading Philippians 1, 27 through 30. Just one thing... 
live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear about you and that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, working side by side for the faith that comes from the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your deliverance, and this is from God, for it has been given to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him, having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. May God bless the reading of His Word. You may be seated. Please join with me in an attitude of prayer. Father God, we thank You so much for Your Word. We thank You for Paul who is who has been inspired by the Holy Spirit to write so much of your word. We're thankful for lessons that we find in multiple books of Paul. Uh, The lesson to stand firm, uh, the lesson to to suffer as Christ suffered. We thank you for those lessons, and we thank you for the repetition. Uh, We are finite, and we need help, and we need that reminding and that repetition We need that example found in different books, and we thank you so much for that. And we know that you understand us more than we understand ourselves. Father, I'd like to also thank you for our mothers, and I I pray that you will bless them extra special today. Uh, I pray that our mothers will receive more than just crumbs today. Uh, Father, we we just uh, thank you for everything that you've given us and for the the blessings that we don't even recognize and understand. And Lord, just be with us as we walk through the end of Philippians 1. And may we take that and grow from that. We thank you for Jesus, for his sacrifice for us, for the wisdom that he has given us, for the life that he led for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well... You may have noticed that our verses this morning did not say anything about citizenship. As far as we can see in our English translation, and, and, and how does citizenship tie in to what we are talking about? Well, it's important for the Philippians that Paul is saying these things because he knew that as citizens of Philippi, they understood what it meant to be part of a Roman colony, and that some of them were proud to be Roman citizens, and sometimes that pride stood in the way, and he was reminding them to replace that idea of being a citizen of Rome with a different citizenship. And he addresses the citizenship here in this passage, but he also addresses it later in Philippians chapter 3. And that is how we tie in this idea of citizenship. And it reminds us of the importance of taking in all of Scripture, to not just looking at a piece here, a verse here, but we interpret Scripture with Scripture. We look at Scripture as a whole, and it's very important. But we we think, and maybe you've already asked, how does Paul address this this idea of citizenship? Because the word citizenship is not found here in Philippians 1. But if we look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, and we read where Paul writes, But our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, citizenship in heaven. Now, the Greek word for citizenship there in chapter 3 is polyutma. Polyutma. That means citizenship in chapter 3. The Greek word in Philippians 3.20 is so very similar to the Greek word that we find in Philippians 1 this morning, in today's Scripture. The phrase, 
Live your life, which we find in Philippians 1. Live your life. That phrase in Greek is polyumai. So we have polyuma and polyumai. Just the tiniest differentiation. These two words have the same root word and they have a similar meaning. Paul is saying here in today's verse that as a Christian, knowing where you are going after death, that these Philippians are to act as citizens of heaven and behave in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. One means citizenship, polyuma, and the other is the act of living like a citizen, polyuma. The noun versus the verb. So what does it look like to act as a citizen of heaven? To behave in a manner worthy of the gospel? Well, what a person believes determines how a person behaves. If a person believes wrongly, if a person believes in self-love, in you do you, whatever feels good, some of the things that we talked about a little bit last week, if, if we believe in the things of this world, then that person is going to behave wrongly. In contrast, a person who believes rightly, a person who believes the gospel, who is a member of the gospel partnership, like the church at Philippi, then they should behave rightly. Christian, conduct yourselves in a way that brings Christ glory. Behave with integrity. Model the message you have embraced. Being a believer is a high calling. And we talked about in Sunday school this morning, in Ephesians, it's hard. Our teacher, that was our our, our teacher's way of putting it. It's hard being a Christian. It's a high calling, and it's a privilege that we are granted. And some people don't take it seriously enough. It's a privilege that we have. Pastors are supposed to lead a prayerful lifestyle. They are supposed to visit members of the body. They are to encourage the body. Pastors are to be holy. However, the pastor is not to do these things because he is the pastor. He should do those things. As an example, he should be doing those things. But he is to do those things as a Christian. And all Christians are to do these things. Every believing member of the congregation is to do these types of things. And by maintaining this high calling toward one another, the Philippians could live the life of a citizen of heaven. Why? Why is it so important to believe that way? Well, when the unsaved church, the unsaved, excuse me, look at the church, and they do not see holiness, they do not see purity, they do not see virtue, there appears to be no reason to believe in the gospel that is proclaimed. What, what do they have? What, what makes them different? Do not weaken the credibility of the gospel of Christ with your behavior. Do not bring Christ disrepute. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, And if you know yourselves to be living in any sin, may God help you to mourn over it, to loathe it, To go to Christ about it tonight. To take hold of Him. To wash His feet with your tears. To repent sincerely. 
and then to begin anew in his strength. A life that shall be such as becomes the gospel. Bring your life into conformity with your true homeland if you are a believer in Christ. After discussing in detail what it means to live as a citizen of heaven, we can move on to Paul's description of how to live that way. And the first thing that Paul talks about is to stand firm. Stand firm. Be adamant about your life as a citizen of heaven. And he wrote the same thing to the Ephesians. Stand firm. And we see that again and again in Scripture. Do not sway back and forth when it comes to the truth. It's okay to sway back and forth as we worship. I say that mainly because I know that I do it. Sometimes I, I feel myself and I'm thinking, gosh, how do I look from behind? Mark, don't answer that. It, we, we sway back and forth as we worship, but don't sway back and forth in the truth. Stand firm. The gospel is the truth, and we must stand for that truth. Matthew 10, verse 22, reads, You will be hated by everyone because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be delivered. Endure until the end. Do not waver. Do not change. Grow Yes. Mature. Yes. But do not waver. Do not turn back. This is just as true for the church as a whole as it is for the individual believer. Warren Wearsby once wrote that the local church is one generation short of potential extinction. Think about that. One, the, the church is one generation short of potential extinction. What would happen to the church if everyone stopped coming? If we stopped bringing our children? If we stopped inviting those around us? Those that we see are in need of church, in need of a church family? What would happen if we stopped those things? We must stand firm. The church must engage in a teaching ministry so that each new generation of believers will know, appreciate, and use the great heritage of the faith. Young churchgoers are being attacked just like in Egypt, where Jewish boys were killed to prevent the growth of a Jewish army, so Satan attacks our young in the church. Church, we must be adamant. We must stand firm. We must teach our children what they must know to be adamant for the gospel. The worst enemies of the church are not the atheists or the Muslims, the Hindu, or whomever, but the hypocrites, those who profess but do not believe, the lukewarm. How can the Sunday school children, how can the youth believe what we tell them if our actions contradict the teachings of Jesus. We must stand firm and be adamant. Right about now, we want to pass. I want to pass. It's like, okay, back up, Jake. You're being a little rough. You're being a little hard. That is tough work. And 
gosh, when we, when we really think about it, we all have hypocrisy in our lives, don't we? We all struggle with something. We know we should do this. We know we're told to do that. And yet, we have a struggle. On our own, we fail. We need Jesus. We need the Spirit to help us, to shore us up, to teach us, to lead us. We need Christ. So don't think I don't recognize that. This is hard. This is difficult. Paul continues, we are to be in one spirit. The church at Philippi is to have one spirit, one direction, one intent, one goal. The church at Bible Christian is to have one spirit as well. The body of Christ is to be of one spirit. Psalm 133, verse 1 and verse 3a read, How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. It is like the dew of Hermon falling on the mountains of Zion. The atmosphere of the church should be an atmosphere of unity. And Scripture speaks of unity through Paul in multiple places. The Word speaks of Christians as a unified body. And here in today's Scripture, Paul writes that the Philippian church is to be not only of one spirit, but also of one mind, working side by side. Members of the gospel partnership are to be united in thought, united in attitude, in thought, and in action. We're not to be cookie-cutter versions of the same thing. We're not to be exact copies. We have our uniqueness. We have our individuality. We have our individual gifts that have been given to us by God. But we are to have the same attitude, thought, and action and focus on Christ. Teamwork makes the dream work. Kind of cliche. Maybe you've heard it in the business world, but teamwork makes the dream work, and it does. So often we go through life thinking of me, myself, and I. Or am I the only one? Me, myself, and I. Even as Christians, My walk with Christ, my trials. When somebody needs help, we lend a hand. But sometimes, Christians, we need help. We need prayer. We need help. We need guidance. We need uplifting. But what do we tell ourselves? I think especially as Americans, what do we tell ourselves? Well, I can handle it. I can pull myself up by my bootstraps. I can do this myself. We can handle our own problems. It is between me and God. Not true, Christian. You are part of a partnership. You are part of a family. You are part of a colony. United in attitude. United in action. United in thought. In 1 Peter 3, verse 8. Now finally, all of you should be like-minded and sympathetic. Should love believers And be compassionate and humble. That sympathy, that compassion, that love is right here in the church. If we are like-minded with one goal, working side by side, that brotherly and sisterly love can encourage us and lift us up. 
While working in unity to advance the gospel, we can work with the Holy Spirit to advance each other as well. Now, I'm not saying jump up in front of everybody every day and say, well, here's, here's my problems, here's, here's my, here's my uh, trials that I'm facing, and, and please pray for me. But there are brothers and sisters within this church that maybe you can form a partnership with, and I mean just one-on-one prayer partner that can help you lift you up. Or turn to your elders and ask them and say, hey, I'm struggling here. This particular part, God tells me to do this and I'm struggling. What can I do? Help me, encourage me, pray for me. And maybe, you know, just be like, church, I'm struggling. We can all lift you up in prayer. We're here to edify each other and encourage each other and pray for each other. This unity, this fellowship, this togetherness can help to advance the gospel and help us to stand firm, not being frightened in any way by our opponents, as Paul writes in verse 28. Those who oppose the gospel, those who seek to do us harm, those who persecute us. In Christ, we can be fearless in the face of that opposition. If we are in Christ. And Jesus said, and it was recorded in Luke chapter 12, He said, And I say to you, my friends, don't fear those who kill the body, and after that can do nothing more. But I will show you the one to fear. Fear him who has authority to throw people into hell after death. Yes, I say to you, this is the one to fear. Aren't five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten in God's sight. Indeed, the hairs of your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than sparrows. Luke 12, verses 4 through 7. As a citizen of heaven, your enemies can do you no harm in eternity. Do you think there is fear in heaven? Do the saints of heaven fear the atheists on Facebook? Do they fear the scoffers in Hollywood? Do they fear those in our community who vandalize and steal from our churches? No. Those saints are are citizens of heaven. None of these people can touch their citizenship. Christian, believer, You too are a saint. You are a citizen of heaven. Do not be afraid. Be fearless. Be like that which you believe. The gospel is fearless in what it has to say. So let the Christians always be fearless. Do not fear your enemies. How can you have no fear, you may ask? Because we know that enemies will fall. Psalm 44, verse 5. Through you we drive back our foes. Through your name we trample our enemies. Our God is with us and He is for us. He knows us inside and out. Who can be against us? Saints of Bible Christian, your Father knows every hair on your head. And though you may face trials, He is with you. 
and He is driving back your foes. And these saints are here with you too. These brothers and sisters, we are here with you. We love you. And we're by your side. If you are in Christ, if your identity is in Christ, you are a Christian, your enemies will fall. Because if you are in Christ, then your enemies are Christ's enemies. And we know that Christ is already victorious. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 22 through 25. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits. Afterward, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he lends over the kingdom to God the Father. When he abolishes all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet. If you are in Christ, you will be made alive. Because Christ has already defeated death. He is already victorious over all of his enemies. That is my Savior. That is my Redeemer. My Redeemer lives. Is He your Savior? Do you believe that God, in the form of Christ, the Son of the Father, humbled Himself by being born a baby, a fully human baby, born of a Virgin Mary, who lived a life just like yours, who faced temptations, and trials, yet he knew no sin. He was persecuted. He suffered. He took on your sin. He took on my sin. Do you believe that that Son of God, Son of Man, was killed on a cross, but three days later rose from the grave, giving you the hope and the truth that someday you too will rise? Has God called you, drawn you to Himself through His Word? If not, I pray that He does. I pray that He does. Because we want you to be a part of this family, this partnership, this colony. And if God calls you, and you proclaim Jesus Christ as your Lord, you gain strength. I pray that He may grant you, according to His riches of, of His glory, to be strengthened with power in the inner man through His Spirit. In Christ, you can trust that God will cause your enemies to fall, that Jesus will be victorious and reign over all, and that the Holy Spirit will give you strength. Strength to fearlessly join the colony of heaven and push the gospel of Christ forward. Living for Christ and for His gospel. You can live fearlessly in this life even when you are called to suffer for Christ and for His gospel. For it has been given to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for Him. And that's verse 29. <clears throat> and it's not a maybe, it's a promise. If you have faith in the gospel, if you believe in Christ, you will endure persecution. Matthew 5, 15. You are blessed when they insult and persecute you, and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Be glad and rejoice, because your reward is great in heaven. For that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before. Faith and suffering cannot be separated. Good news does not equal easy news. 
Paul ch- closes this chapter saying that the Philippians have the same struggle that he had previously had in Philippi and still had at the time of this letter. Before we close on this morning's verse, I want to go back to the beginning of verse 27. Paul says, just one thing. Just one thing. All three of these verses can be summarized as just one thing. This is an example of how you are to live individually and corporately. Individually living as a citizen of heaven. Corporately living as a colony of heaven. And what is a colony? A colony is a group of people living under the control of another kingdom. Does that not fit Bible Christian Church? Living as a group of people under the control of another kingdom. The church is a colony of heaven. BCC is a colony of heaven. And as a citizen of heaven, you can have peace. Jesus spoke these words in John 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. You will suffer. But do not be frightened. Stand firm in unity and be delivered. Do you behave what you believe? Do you behave what you believe? Are you a citizen of heaven? And for those of you who don't feel like you are a citizen of heaven, if you feel like you're being called, if you feel like you're being drawn, come forward this morning. We can pray for you. We can help you, encourage you. If you have questions about this Jesus fellow, And why Paul seems to like him so much. We can help you with that. Are you a citizen of heaven? And are you acting like one? Let us close in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the words that you have given us through Paul. Father, we thank you for Jesus, for his sacrifice for us. Father, we thank you that we are in Christ. I thank you for the believers that are here today. And we can not only take up the crumbs that you give us, but the feast of blessings that you give us, the salvation that comes as a citizen of heaven. Father, we thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that as we go out, that we will share our citizenship with others that we will encourage others to join our colony. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.